Good day. My name is Victoria Day, and I'm one of the programmers with the Feminist Radio Collective here at KOPN called Women's Issues, Women's Voices. And today I feel very honored to be getting the opportunity to talk with Margie Sable. Um, Margie and I have talked about uh, her involvement with KOPN in the past, her involvement with women's issues. She has been inspiring. I am going to open it up. Uh, with what would you like the folks to know about you, Margie? Well, uh, <laughs> that's kind of an open-ended question. It is an open-ended question. Um, you know, uh, KOPN actually changed the course of my life in uh, a significant way, which is that I was living in St. Louis, and I was interested in getting involved in radio and uh, there was a station founded by Jeremy Landsman in St. Louis called KDNA, which he, he sold at one point, and the equipment was then donated to people here in Columbia who were trying to get a radio station going, which was KOPN. And, um, you know, things were going slowly in St. Louis with trying to get, they now have a station, KDHX, but mm -hmm. When I was living there, um, you know, it just was going slowly. So at one point I had the opportunity to move with my job to a position here in Columbia. I was working for Reproductive Health Services in St. Louis and uh, they had a position that was open here for counseling and referrals to the clinic in St. Louis. And so I thought that would give me a chance to uh, do radio. So. I moved here really for that job, but really because I would be able to work at KOPN. Oh, and exciting. so I, um, I remember the first time that I came to the station, I moved here and very shortly after I moved in, I came down here and came up and uh, Jean Palmquist, I think was the lead person for the feminist radio collective at the time, which was called the Crystal Set Feminists. And she was up here and I talked to her, you know, I just sort of showed up and said, hi, I'm Margie and I want to do radio, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and she said, yes. And she said, yeah. So, so, you know, I had to get a license and I had to, mm -hmm. you know, go to Kansas City and get the license and do all that. But I got involved with the Crystal Set Feminists and did the, we rotated the Sunday programs like you do now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did a couple of other programs too, which was, uh, I did one of the morning air programs, uh, which played, you know, wake up classical, mm -hmm. Baroque, uh, Baroque Renaissance and classical music. And I started a new program on Thursday evenings called The Brazen Hussy. Mm -hmm. And for that program, I played all uh, women's music. So uh, not, it, not necessarily feminist music, but all women artists. So mm -hmm. sometimes I would play folk, and sometimes I would play, play rock, and sometimes I would play blues. Uh, sometimes I would play jazz. You know, there's so many female musicians in all those categories. What was the time period of this? It was 9.30 to midnight. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I don't stay up that late anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, uh, and then I would have guests come mm -hmm. up. Sometimes they would come up and play music. Sometimes they would come up and talk about a certain topic that I was focusing on. Um, I used to call them guest hussies, and they would have their own names. My name for that program was Rosie O'Reilly, and I kind of got into that identity for a yeah. while. Well, it, and, and I've wondered this when we've talked about this before, where did the idea for the name come from? Well, I had a friend in St. Louis whose car was named the Brazen Hussy, and so <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> and uh, my middle name is Rose, so I came up with Rosie. But what I didn't finish telling you uh, was that because I moved to Columbia, the next year I met my husband and um, or the person who would become my husband, and I had these two kids, and you know, none of that would have happened if I hadn't wanted to do radio. Mm -hmm. So there you go. So you were with KOPN from the beginning. So we're talking. 
No, no, I moved here in 1978. 1978. And so KOPN was five years old already. But it was a very uh, exciting time because they had VISTA grants for VISTA volunteers. And there was another kind of grant. I can't remember the name, but it was a, a federal grant for mm -hmm. volunteers of a, a certain kind. I think maybe working in cities or something. Mm -hmm. So we had people here who came here for to be a you know, as part of their service to VISTA or this other program. And uh, there was just a lot of energy up here at the time, but um, yeah. uh, it was easy to, you know, get involved. I mean, it really was sort of the central focus of my life for a couple of years. So I'm thinking about, um, so the Brazen Hussey was in the 80s? That would have been women's No, music. it was uh, from about 79 to 81. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just thinking about that time period because uh, I feel like I, I wasn't um, as connected with women's music as it sounds like you were, but I was at, at Wash U at that time and and went from, you know, growing up in a small town where we had both kinds of music, country and western, you know, that joke, um, and then going and just being exposed to I, I mean, I don't even remember. So you probably came to some of the concerts that I helped produce in St. Louis. Okay. I worked with a, a women's music production collective called Tomato Productions. Yeah. And, you know, some of the concerts that we produced were in the women's building. Mm -hmm. Some of them were, you know, at at music venues, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, different, different theaters and stuff. But, um, yeah, so... Yeah. So that was like, that was that time period, yeah, as I said, <laughs> and in fact, I remember one time. So I, uh, I can't remember the circumstances, but Chris Williamson was, I think, going from a concert in St. Louis to a concert in Kansas City, and for some reason, she stopped in Columbia overnight. Mm -hmm. I don't know where she stayed, but they all, she and her entourage had dinner at my house, the first house mm -hmm. I lived in. I had no furniture. We all sat on pillows. <laughs> <laughs> and then I interviewed her on KOPN. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway. Got to interview her live. Well, yeah, live. Yeah, I just, as I said, she, she might have had a performance here. I'm not sure. Yeah. I can, you know, it's kind of a blur. I mean, that's one of the things that excited me about being part of this oral history and talking with you is because, like when I think about that and I think about you, like it's almost like for me there's a little bit of this glimmer around it. Like that just sounds, you know. Well, it was, it was all new, and, yeah. And it, was, and it was you living your life. Yeah. Like it wasn't like you were thinking, I'm gonna be sitting here all those years right, later. <laughs> right, it just fit in because what I had done in St. Louis for in terms of concert production, translated into, you know, knowing that music and playing it on, on the radio, on KOPN. But I also learned so much about music that I didn't know. You know, um, as like I said, I, I played all these different genres of music uh, on, the, on the Brazen Hussey show. And, you know, I just would go through the albums and, and learn from other programmers about um, you know, old blues musicians and jazz musicians and, mm -hmm. um, you know, even rock and folk musicians who I hadn't heard of prior to moving here. So uh, it was just very exciting to just learn about all of these great musicians and be able to play them on the radio. And then I can tell you as a, as a young woman just emerging out of small town Missouri, to be exposed to those kind of women's voices. I mean, women actually talking about themselves in ways I'd never heard, you know? Um, that's what I said, inspiring. Like, and that's, you've affected a whole generation of women. Yeah. Right, that you may never even. And, and you know, you know this as a programmer, you never know who's listening and who it touches. Yeah. Or if it touches, you know, but, uh, you know, I. I used to get feedback. There was a guy who was at the VA hospital who listened to KOPN, and he, he used to listen to my show. And one time, we used to do uh, on-air auctions during the pledge drives. We'd auction off different things, like mm -hmm. I bought a hair dryer, you know, when I was homesick and didn't have a hair dryer. 
But uh, I don't know, there was something that I would, we were auctioning something off and, and this guy bought it and he said, I want to give it to Rosie. You know, it was a little, mm -hmm. a little ceramic pot that said brazen proposals on it or something, mm. you know. So, you know, that was just sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true community. It was nice yeah. to know that people were listening because, you know, you don't always know. Don't always know, yeah. Did you have other roles other than programming? Uh, I was on the board off and on for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I got on the board shortly after I moved here and, um, you know, off and on through, through the years. So one of the questions... I Probably had, till I started having kids and didn't have any more time, but yeah. Time. yeah. So as a programmer or as a board member, I mean, were there times where uh, that you or the station was facing something and you just weren't sure like how you were gonna manage it and yet, that's one of the questions I don't have an answer know? for okay. so no <laughs> never felt like it was a challenge there was challenges yeah okay. yeah you just rolled with it yeah I mean yeah. I I think I think that um you know we were always worried about getting getting enough money for the pledge drives but um and in those days, we were not very sophisticated in how we asked for money. I would say uh, some of the late night programs, you know, they would <laughs> just sort of beat pots and pans until people called in and stuff like that. <laughs> uh -huh. I did, uh, one of the first things I did on uh, Moon, Moon of Artemis was the Sunday afternoon show mm -hmm. that the Crystal Set Feminist did. Mm -hmm. It was called Moon of Artemis. And during a pledge drive, I think maybe one of the first pledge drives that I was involved with, uh, Kay Callison and I did a, an abortion speak out because I was working with reproductive health services um, and doing counseling for women who were seeking abortions. And so we did an abortion speak out and we asked women to call in and if they'd had an abortion and, and talk about it and their experience. and things like that and we raised you know we raised a lot of money and people called in and it was it, it was slow in the beginning but Kay and I each talked about our own experiences and then other people started calling in wow. and I, I felt like that was an impactful uh, you know program to to do and I, I think that Jackie did a similar thing Jackie Castile. Castile. I think More she, because I remember reading an article about her in the paper and how she had done that, and mm -hmm. and I was like, well, that was great because it's it's all it's never stops being relevant, mm -hmm. especially now that you know our laws are becoming more and more restrictive. Becoming more and more restrictive, and we may lose the the right to universal access altogether. Yeah, yeah. Be right. Good time for do another one. Is that what attracted you to the women's programming? Were those kind of issues? Well, I think I, because of having worked in St. Louis with Tomato Productions and, and producing women's music, mm -hmm. I was naturally interested in it because I was, I was already listening to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it sounds like that, I mean, that there weren't, because of the uh, environment of Columbia, it wasn't like it was a challenging uh, concept to be bringing women's voices, women's issues in. It in was already happening. It was happening, yeah. I mean, it was happening, I would say, probably at the beginning mm -hmm. of KOPN because those people were, were here then. Yeah. Do you remember the first time, it, was it the first time you came here? Was it this actual built, the offices that were on um, on Broadway? Oh, yeah. This, right. this is the only place I think that, that it's been. Okay. Um, do you remember that? Do you remember anything about that? Well, I was just wondering, like, you know, because we were talking about like coming in and seeing all the albums and the. Oh yeah, I, I came. Know. Well, I came. I came up for the first time, mm -hmm. um, very soon after I got here, and um, there were a lot of people, a lot of hustle bustle, people working on their shows, people working on the recordings, you know, in the recording booth, all people that's planning and. and before the internet, be before email. <laughs> be here on hand. You had to record your show. 
Wow. Well, we did a, we did the shows live, but some of the people recorded mm -hmm. their shows, and so they were. Um, I did a, a recording of uh, it was a program called Handicapped Women. Even the term handicapped is not used now, you know. Right. But um, I interviewed um, a group of women who had various types of disabilities, mm -hmm. um, and put that together with music and uh, so that was recorded. I had to edit it, you know, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty heavily because it was long, but. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I, I, and I, you know, as I'm listening to what I'm like, I'm just like struck that these are all shows that are still so relevant. All these shows could be updated with, with current people, you know, I mean, I think there have been a lot of inroads, but um, in especially in disability, um, but the issues are still the same. Mm -hmm. You know, inroads in terms of services and access and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. When I when I did that program, there was no Americans with Disabilities Act. Oh, because what, what? Well, that was 70, probably uh, 1980. 80. Okay. Yeah. So that, again, well, so that's, so the next question is, like, how has the, cha the station changed since you were involved? But I'm also hearing not just the station changing, but culturally, I mean. I mean, so many things have changed, like you said, technologically, and I think that's had a big impact, you know, on, and maybe made it easier for people mm -hmm. uh, to do things. Well, right, because I, it's, I never even thought about this, but at one point, we really were just a mid-Missouri station because it's whoever could get the... Right. Now when I go out of town, I just click on, you know, I can go to kopn.org and click on it and listen to it. So. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Do you think that that's changed the, like, the, the feel of the station, of, like, what we're sharing at all? Because we're now, like... You can listen to it anywhere in the world. Mm. Uh, you know, I haven't been up here as a programmer for a long time, so you would probably be a better person to answer that. Do you think it's changed it? Well, sometimes I, I find myself looking on the map, right, and trying to filter out what are the bots, you know, because you know that some of those people who've been listening for five days are not real humans. Um, but going, oh, you know, there's somebody, like, why is that person in California? Why did they just log in 10 minutes ago? I mean, does it change, like, how you address your audience? I don't think it changes how I address issues. Um, I do think that it, it's given me permission, and especially with what happened during COVID and uh, recording shows through Zoom, I feel a lot more confident about contacting, like, uh, like I just contacted a woman um, who does this podcast called Once Upon a Goddess, and... I think she's in Europe, and I went on Facebook and told her about the show that Corey and I do on Women's Issues, Women's Voices, mm -hmm. the Goddess Hour, said, would you be willing to be interviewed? And she popped back and said, you know, I would love it. I, I don't know that I really, before COVID, I really thought about how my voice was going out beyond, you know, those names that are on the list of mm -hmm. the, all the little towns. So I would I would think more like talking to that that audience like who in my hometown of Mexico Missouri might be listening mm -hmm. you know what is it that they want to know or will be uh, inspired by about women's issues but then also thinking about it now oh globally yeah yeah and and I did as I said I did talk about I did have different themes on the uh, brazen hussy where we talked about different topics sometimes I would meet someone. And they would be very interesting. And I'd say, oh, can you come up and, and talk about that? I, I interviewed uh, a flight attendant, mm -hmm. a woman flight attendant. And she came up, and, and she was also involved in the union. I think she might have been a union steward or something for flight attendants. And she was talking about a lot of the issues relevant to flight attendants that I had no idea about, like, you know, the quality of the air and how that affects their skin and you know, just other other issues that were important to the health and well-being and safety of, of flight attendants. And um, I thought about her recently with 
you know, during COVID when mm -hmm. we've heard about the unruly passengers making mm -hmm. demands and, you know, being a, a abusive towards flight attendants. Mm -hmm. So, Well, and yeah. just the attitude about flight attendants has definitely, I mean, changed. I mean, in my lifetime, I feel like, you know, there was a time where there were they were very sexualized and yeah. diminished, and, and now I, I don't hear that. It, it, you know, I can't remember a time that that was, and I'm, I don't know if that has to do with the fact that it's now a profession that both men and women are in, and so it's now seen as a legitimate mm -hmm. profession. You know, um, yeah. So when you're talking about live interviews, so something that we've been talking about in the collective you know, I've gotten out of practice of doing live interviews now because everything I do is on Zoom. And I realize that there is a, a sense of security because if someone says a bad word or they say something and they come back and they say, okay, I want that edited out, like uh -huh. I have developed those skills. Right. Live interviews. Yeah, sometimes, it, <laughs> sometimes they just kind of go on and on and you're thinking, oh, I, got, I need to cut this and put in a some music or something, yeah. yeah. Do you remember any specific interviews where you were just like in a live interview and you were like, I don't know where I don't remember. Going, is going? Or, I think you know. I remember one person who came up with her guitar mm -hmm. to sing and I was not enamored with her music particularly, but <laughs> I was a good sport about it. And you know, and it, it, it doesn't matter that I think a lot of people did enjoy it. So mm -hmm. I, I did like having um, live music. Yeah. If so people wanted anything to play. unexpected ever happened that like you were No. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that makes me feel a little cuz I'm I'm I've noticed that I'm feeling a little hesitant about going back on live, you know, cuz I've had the security blanket now, uh -huh. you know, for 2 years. Um let's see. Uh So KOPN has hosted a lot of events over the years. Um on-air programming, concerts? We did a lot of concerts when I first came. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, uh, I don't think you do that many concerts now, yeah. but we did a lot of them and there was somebody, Kate Wolf was someone that wow. people really liked a lot. So she had been, uh, she came here to play mm -hmm. uh, before I came to Columbia mm -hmm. and then while I was here, she came back. We brought her back for another concert. And I had to pick her up at the airport. And it was funny because um, it's kind of sad, really, but she asked what I did, and I told her I worked in women's health. And so she said, oh, she had some, she really wanted to see somebody, be, uh, a medical provider, because she, she just felt like there was something not right, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm in the reproductive health area, mm -hmm. you know, with abortion counseling. But, um, you know, she did, that, uh, not that long after that, uh, develop some, I think, some kind of leukemia and she oh. died. So, she so I think she knew there was something wrong right. at that point. But anyway, yeah. uh, on, a, on a brighter note, we, we did bring in some really great musicians that, you know, I only learned about some of these people from playing music here and, you know, going through the record library and learning about a lot of different artists. So that's, so we were talking about your favorite events in, in throughout the years with KOPN. Yeah, um, so we did bring some great musicians mm -hmm. uh, for concerts in venues around Columbia, uh, the Road Apple Party Ballas, um, there was some at, uh, you know, different venues. We also had people who brought artists, uh, people who had grants to bring different artists to Columbia up to the studios to record them live. Ed Herman did a show called Ionizations, which was a kind of a new music, electronic mm -hmm. music show. And he had Laurie Anderson up here in wow. the big room wow. doing a live show. <laughs> Before anybody knew who Laurie Anderson was, oh, that's you know. Fantastic. So uh, that's the kind of thing that that happened here. Yeah. Yeah, because cutting edge. I mean, that's when I try to imagine Columbia without KOPN. It's just a. It, it's just such an integral part of my experience. I mean, I've yeah. Been here since 1997, but I grew up, 
you know, not that far away. It, it, yeah, to me, well, like I said, I, I came here when KOPN was already mm -hmm. in its fifth year, and um, so it was pretty vibrant at that time. And everybody around was young. I mean, everybody was under 30, I think that was involved at that point. Not everybody, but a lot of people. Yeah. You know, it was started by very young people. And, um, and they grew with the station. And the station grew with them. So who are some of those? I mean, we've talked about this before out, uh, so, outside of this interview, but women who were integral in the beginning or have... So know, Pat Watkins mm -hmm. um, was, and, um, was one of the founders of KOPN. She was, I think, the first, maybe the first program director. Um, she was in, not involved in the um, Crystal Set Feminists or doing, playing the feminist music on Sundays at Moon of Artemis, but, but she was very uh, extremely involved in KOPN. Jean Palmquist uh, was one of the uh, chief people with the Crystal Set Feminists. Um, Sherry Wormser mm -hmm. is someone who I met when I first moved here, and she did programming on KOPN. She did a lot of jazz and blues mm -hmm. um, as well, um, and we became really good friends. I, I would say that, you know, for the first two years that I lived in Columbia and I was involved with KOPN at that time, KOPN people were my were my Best friends and family, yeah. yeah. It was before. This is how, these were the first people that I met, and um, and you know who I have remained close with over the years, even though so many people have have scattered. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy Herman was involved. Emmy Triplett, Annette. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember Annette's last name. Charlotte mm -hmm. Navarre. Well, and then like uh, Kay Callison, you mentioned. I remember hearing her under her previous recording name. Right, of Kay, Kay Benetti. Benetti. Mm -hmm. And being the, just blown away when I first met Kay Callison and someone said, you know who that is, right? Yeah, She's and like, she got a big grant oh. to do the audio oh. prose library. Yeah. And yeah, people at KOPN were very creative and, um, mm -hmm. and did a lot of really cool things. Mm -hmm. there, were, there was... You know, my, they didn't need a lot of money to do what they did, but they were able to write grants and get enough to, to do some pretty innovative programming. Yeah. And and to be creative. I mean, that's that's what I. Or to to use their creativity yeah. to to share with the audience. To share with yeah. Well, and I as you're talking, I'm I'm like. We're trying to remember I'm, who everybody is yeah. because. Well, now I'm, I'm, my involvement now with KOPN is that I'm on the capital campaign committee to raise. Six hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars for the new building and re mm -hmm. and renovations and all of that, and so that's been a great way to get reinvolved with KOPN. Um, as I was coming up the stairs today, I thought I cannot believe that we have existed in this space for so long without being accessible. Oh, right, without having. Uh, we're not accessible. That the flight of stairs is daunting, you know, yeah. and uh, and it's yeah. just great that we're moving to an accessible space. Uh, yeah. um, I'm excited about that, and um, so I'm how I'm yes. That's the other challenge. That what? Easier parking. Easier parking. That's the other challenge that as a programmer. So that's how I've been involved um, in the last year has mm -hmm. been with that committee and. Um, and Mayor and I have been trying to remember everybody who was up here mm -hmm. uh, and trying to contact them to mm -hmm. talk about the capital campaign and, you know, our, our 50th anniversary year. We're hoping some of them will come back. Um, well, I'm impressed because I try to think back um, to how I got involved 20 years ago, and I think it was Corey Flaker Frazier, um, and that was when Women's Issues, Women's Voices was... I think Sarah was part of it, Royda Kroos, who has passed, um, and Carol Greenspan, who's still kicking it as a programmer. Um, but I don't, I don't ever remember, I don't have any memory of the story of like, hey, would you be a programmer? And me going, yeah, sure. I, I don't know. I just You don't I, remember <laughs> how that happened. 
<laughs> just I, kind of snuck up on you. The, the, the one thing that I do remember is one of my first interviews um, or shows, I don't, I don't even remember if I was interviewing somebody, was about women's literature. And the, someone, and it was a call-in show, and someone, a, a young woman called in and was complaining that I shouldn't be uh, focusing on just women's literature because that was disrespectful that, that there was also men who were writers. And it was, I remember having this moment of being able to explain to her that when I graduated from school in 1982, I had only been exposed to maybe five women's writers and none of them were alive. And then I, in those early 80s, there were this, I don't know if it was that there was this rush of women who were becoming recognized, like people now who are everyday, like everyday names, Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou and um, uh, uh, Margaret Adler and uh, Atwood, Margaret Atwood. Um, but that like, you know, that, that women who had, were born in the 80s took all of that for granted, right? That, that there were women's literature classes. And, and that's the only interview I remember doing, but it was the thing that hooked me, is if I can keep weaving stories from different perspectives at, of women's lives, and that's important work, yeah. Yeah, it's just fun to reminisce about KOPN. Uh, it's been fun to get in touch, for me to get in touch with people that used to be here who are no longer here. I'm still looking for Sherry. I have no idea where she is, but we'd like to reconnect with her. And um, yeah. So it's kind of like the greatest high school class reunion ever. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, thank it's you. It's true. Thank you. Thank you for being part of the KOPN Oral History Project. Thank you. It's been fun.